Ready? <laughs> Sucks, eh? <laughs> yeah. Alright, let's get this going. Okay. Hey guys, what are you at? My name is Troy, I'm here with my buddy. I'm Mike. And welcome back to Facility D20. Thanks for hanging out with us. Today we're going to have a series of videos where we're going to show you guys some of the D&D encounter maps that we built, why we built them, and uh, how it went from the player's perspective. Mike is one of, uh, one of the players in my campaign here, and he's going to kind of talk about his experiences and if I managed to pull off what I tried to pull off. And if we managed to thwart whatever he was trying to do. Which usually happens, <laughs> generally. Yeah. So basically this map, our party um, has been playing for a while. I think you guys are 12th level now, maybe 13th, yeah. 12th 12, level? 12th level. 12th level, and they've been hunting down this master assassin. Uh, they eventually learned his true name, mm. got their hands on a 9th level gate spell. Thank God for random tables. So pro tip, they're difficult to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> so they hatched a plan to sail out to sea. Uh, go down about what? 500, 500 feet? 500 feet under the ocean floor, set up an ambush, and use the gate spell to pull him unexpectedly through. Yeah, it's not a whole lot a master assassin can do when he's suddenly 500 feet under the sea, surrounded by a bunch of people who can breathe and see underwater. Yeah, so this was, uh, this was a fun encounter to build here. The, uh, the party's been chasing this guy for almost since the start of the camp campaign, really. Yeah, he was one of the first villains that you introduced. Yeah, and uh, 40 sessions later... We finally got him. We finally got him, uh, due to some uh, sidetrack missions. <laughs> yeah, we're not exactly known to stay on task. Um, but he's not part of the main campaign anyway. So basically the idea was I wanted to build an underwater counter and kind to uh, try to actually like reproduce that feeling of like being in this like blue abyss underwater. So I'm just going to show you this short video here of what I used to set it up. So this is the encounter we set up on the table of Ultimate Gaming. It was pretty simple and pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do. Uh, here we have our ship that we've been using the entire campaign from uh, printable scenery. I'll put the link in the description. This is a nice little kit. We printed off a few of these. I've got it up on a set of combat tiers. This pretty much took the whole set of combat tiers, but it was nice because it gave that elevation, that depth to the encounter that I was looking for. You can see some aquarium plants. I picked these up super cheap on Amazon a while back. I've got a whole bag of them. Um, here you can see the shark mini and the um, sailor mini that I was going to use in this encounter. The shark being the giant shark and of course the miniature being the master mage assassin that the guys were trying to uh, ambush. This is another piece of aquarium decor here with the gray rock and the orange plant life. Um, coming around this corner though, there's actually a few pieces of actual coral. This is from a, a saltwater fish tank that I had. I had extra coral rock line around so I kind of use it here in this encounter worked pretty well here you can see that uh, there's a nice crevice going up through the center of this mat which is why I picked it I kind of wanted to have a little more depth to the mat um, this I found this on a Google search but I think it's from the patreon neutral party if you want to check those guys out and this is a nice little uh, ship this one actually had a uh, bubble maker inside of it, but I kind of tore all the guts out of it and just going to use it for some uh, scatter terrain. Um, and here you can see up and under the ship, we've got some combat tiers to provide some levels of play here. Uh, all in all, this is a pretty easy encounter for anybody to set up, but if you're looking to do something underwater, I think kind of you kind of like to get that 3D element here, which is why you kind of want to get some height to your battle. That mat that is sitting on, I think it's a mat, uh, mat by Mars, vinyl water mat. I'll do a little review on that. If it's something you're interested in, hit subscribe. So what I was trying to do here, the idea here was I wanted to make them feel like they were actually like under something. There were some height and some layers to the battle, which is why you can see I built the ship up and why I made the, the mat have like a crevasse in it. So that kind of get like these layers of play. Um, I also used um, not so much the darkness rules, 
but the darkness rules would a tweak because the way I saw it is like uh, when you see those underwater movies like Jaws and stuff and you're you're diving in the cage and there's just like this blue abyss yeah and so the first thing the player said of course when I said it was they can't see was well we all got dark vision. dark vision <laughs> yeah. so I tweaked it a little bit so that they could still only see about um, 30 30 40 feet before it just kind of became a blue haze mm -hmm. and I think one of the players um, used some Dancing lights or uh, was light. Uh, he cast light on a rock. Yes, and he he placed a rock. Yeah, and got an extra fuel of vision. So one of the things I was trying to do here, of course, was use uh, the drowning rules. Now, here's this pro tip about the drowning rules. They're not actually called drowning rules. So if you search <laughs> for them like we have for the past ten minutes in the DMG, you won't find them. They're actually under the suffocating Suffocation. rules. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to just pull pull them up there? Uh, they're in the player's hand. Yeah, so suffocating basically says a creature can hold its breath for a number of minutes equal to one plus its constitution modifier, a minimum of 30 seconds. When a creature runs out of breath or it is choking, it can survive for a number of rounds equal to its constitution modifier, minimum one round. At the start of its next turn, it drops zero hit points and is dying, and it can't regain hit points or be stabilized until it can breathe again. So the problem I, f I find with the drowning rules in general is that one plus uh, constitution modifier so let's say that that's a minute or so mm -hmm. or even if it's 45 30 45 seconds or a minute call it then a minute of like battle time is yeah 10 rounds is a lot of rounds yeah. so it's almost like you could we could have had the whole fight and not made the water and drowning actually yeah. been a factor. Yeah. other than the fact that he couldn't speak exactly which came in real right. handy so basically what I did was I home brewed, bro, uh, home brewed some rules here where at the top of his turn, every turn, I rolled 3d6 and he would take that much damage as he sucked in the salt water because he was dragged there completely uh, unexpected. Like, just completely blindsided. So this guy was also a uh, caster. I used the Archmage rules and the Assassin rules and I kind of like mashed them together to make this bad guy. And I gave him a couple legendary actions, two legendary actions, and two legendary resistances. Mm -hmm. uh, the legendary actions were just basically he can take an action. Um, so I knew it was going to be an uphill battle for my arch villain here, despite all that. So I also had a shark that I was planning on kind of slipping <laughs> in there. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mike now. Just see what his opinions was on it. Mike, how did you think uh, it went in terms of like um, the, the depth of the encounter and the darkness and the water? And uh, I think that it was very well put together. Uh, having the murky water and uh, vision being an issue uh, put another layer to it. As well as it being a three-dimensional battlefield rather than the regular two dimensions, where most of our time spent uh, was trying to navigate in a three-dimensional space instead of I walk 60 feet in one direction. It's, no, you got to work with diagonals and stuff, and he's trying to escape up, and then we're trying to drag him back down, and we're trying to get our angles of attack in. And It, it played really well, especially because uh, one of the spells that I personally was using was, uh, I'm a, like you said before, I wear 12th level, but I'm a 12th level druid, and uh, I was pumping out sunbeams, and normally I'm, when it comes to line spells, I'm, uh, I'm more than cautious when it comes to uh, hitting my party members because we run with <laughs> including the NPCs we drag along with us is usually around P uh, six plus people that are friendlies in the combat so I never really feel like using spells like Kona Cold unless I can get a, like a, a clear line of vision or Sunbeam but with the three dimensional play in mind I could position myself directly over top and shoot it straight, straight down. down so then the yeah. only person that was being affected was the bad guy yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool and uh, a really fun thing for me to play with personally. But uh, just as we all uh, were setting up to take it back to the beginning, and we dove down and we found the shipwreck, and uh, the DM had uh, described there was shadows lurking around. And uh, we're like, okay, well, wh what's that? And he's like, we'll make perception checks. And... We all made a, a slew of bad dice rolls and couldn't figure it out at first. And uh, our rogue in the party uh, thought, hmm, maybe it's like a shark or something that's around. Maybe if we 
kill a fish that's around and chum, chum the, the water, water <laughs> that we might be able to convince uh, convince it to come out, take care of the shark, and then fight the bad guy, so we won't have to deal with both of them at the same time. So, our warlock, Eldritch blasts a, sh- a, uh, <laughs> a fish into a hundred pieces, and lo and behold, this giant shark came out of the reef, and uh, <laughs> unexpectedly by the DM, our bard, who has a magic loot that he got very early on in the campaign, uh, managed to use animal friendship on this... Uh, on the shark, and then one of the DM's tools against us became one of our greatest allies yeah. in the fight. <laughs> That's usually how it goes. <laughs> yeah. So we talked about the reef. Like, how did you find like the pieces of reef with the with the rock and the trees? Did you find it useful? Like, I know um, one of the NPCs was kind of tucked over there for some cover and stuff and some ambush points. But like, you, did you find like it was it added it, to the? It definitely added to the atmosphere, if nothing else. And uh, we did use it, like I know the rogue used it for cover and to duck behind and to hide. Yeah. And uh, we also had, uh, we had it so that I was up on a mask, the warlock was up on a mast. And yeah. we had, we had like almost like a kill box set up for yeah. when the gate spell opened up at the bottom of this reef. So he got sucked into this, just like he was in the middle of a kill box essentially until he used his ninth level spell and froze time and ran away for a bit yeah <laughs> and unfortunately like i said because he was underwater um the verbal spells became very difficult so basically he was he was struggling the entire time to even try to cast any of his magic spells so he was he, ha- he had a rough time the, our, the party had a really well thought out plan and as a dm i didn't want to take that away from them i didn't want to just say oh well as a dm i'm going to meta game and know that he's going to be underwater and like change the Heavy character head. or the encounter i said well you know what this was a good plan it kind of came together and i'm not going to take it away from him so i'm going to have the water play a major factor mm-hmm. and it also slowed movement too is another thing we should talk about um yeah according it, to the underwater rules i think they're in the dmg you can find them uh it's around page 116 on the dmg yeah it talks about like the under under sea and stuff and visibility and movement speed and yeah. also affect weapons too is another thing to keep in mind when you're underwater. Yeah. Uh, Any ranged attack underneath the water will be at disadvantage unless you're using a crossbow. A crossbow shoot at uh, a regular shot. Yeah. And because of the because of the height, um, you it have, actually came into play a lot. Yeah, because then you're factoring. You're not a straight shot anymore. Like we said, with the angles of the beams and stuff we were using, you had to take into account the angle of your shot because then after a while, your shot would just lose momentum and then. Drift yeah. off on you. And I should mention too, if you're going to run an encounter underwater encounter, make sure you have uh, something to stack um, levels on. Like we ran out of combat tiers pretty quick, and all of a sudden we were using <laughs> beer bottles and water bottles and uh, yeah. whatever we had. So, but it was kind of fun. It added, it added it, to the fun of it. It definitely did. Yep. Um, I guess the only other thing I should talk about here is that, like, I wanted to reward the party, of course, when they finally killed this villain and, and completed a whole backstory arc for our bard character who was a member of the Harpers. Which I want to add, the way we killed the uh, the big bad is that the shark that he had introduced for an extra enemy, the bard was riding and uh, managed to get the killing blow by riding the shark into the bad guy and, ch- and chomping off his lower half of his body. Yeah, so that was pretty it was pretty fitting for him. He was, he was pretty satisfied with that. Um, but I didn't like he didn't necessarily as a character have a lot of gold on him or a lot of uh, magic items on him, mm-hmm. so I wanted to have like a big reward for the party. So sometimes what you could do is hide the treasures in the environment. Mm-hmm. So as soon as I put a, a broken ship in the bottom of this ravine, I, I knew the party was going to investigate it. So I actually at the bottom of the ocean, you're gonna loot it. You got no choice. Yeah. So I actually put one of the ship upgrades from. Um, Ghost of Saltmarsh, which is the campaign we're playing in there, um, which basically um, makes any invisible creature within the ship uh, become visible yeah. at a certain range. It's a very cool item. It's like a bunch of crystal orbs with beholder eyeballs oh, yeah. in there. So um, I forget what it's called. I'll, I'll pop pop it up here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but um, So it's going to be fun. They're going to stick that on their ship. 
Um, so yeah, overall, we just wanted to start this new series here, show you guys some of these maps and some of the items that we use and how it went and some of the rules that we had to take into consideration and some of the special rules. So if that's something you guys like, stick around, hit the subscribe button. Um, the studio is kind of coming along, so we're going to be making a few more of these videos. Yeah. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching. See you guys.